Kerete. Uh, actually, let me finish this real quick. I think I had just about everyone here. A few. Oh, I already had one started, but if you want to finish that up for me, appreciate it. All right, so we are going to do a quick review of what we started last time. But before we get there, I will just say, um, if you want to dig in a little deeper and maybe get a little better explanation, I am loosely basing this class on this textbook, Greek for the Rest of Us, by Bill Mounts, uh, William D. Mounts, Bill Mounts. Um, he has written kind of the standard Greek grammar that is usually used in seminaries and universities uh, called uh, Basics of Biblical Greek. That one's a little bit more advanced. This one is just kind of, it goes a little deeper than what we're doing, but it would give you some additional explanations if you want it. This is the companion cheat sheet uh, called Greek for the Rest of Us. This is Zondervan's Get an A-plus study guides. But if you want just a quick review, this is a, they sell it as a nice little laminated folder that um, could be helpful. You can look at it after class if you're interested. And then um, if I had to choose, I would not use Thayer. I would actually buy this cheaper um, version of what's called BDAG. I have BDAG in my office, but that's a $150 book, and I don't know if you're interested in buying that one. Um, this one, you can buy the paperback for about seven or eight bucks online. I think the a used hardback like this is probably about 16 to $25, something along that line. Uh, it's called A Shorter Lexicon of the Greek New Testament. You can look at it. The thing I like about that is, I, for instance, um, Ipo that we were talking about where Thayer threw me off. Uh, you know how it had that long list? And if you want to dig in deep, you can. But this one for Ipo, the listing says, preposition with genitive and accusative. One, with genitive, by, denoting the agent or cause, and gives you references. Then two, with accusative, under, below, and then gives you references. Very simple. Uh, and I, I, I really like it because it comes from some of the better lexicographers uh, out there, Gingrich and Donker, the, the, uh, the G and the D of BDAG. <laughs> um, they, they, uh, but I, I actually just found this one recently. Emily and I went down to Priceville Discount Books. Uh, I got this for three or four bucks. Um, so uh, I, it's an extra one. I have a newer one in my library, but uh, if anybody is interested, you can look at that as well. Uh, but I, I think that's probably better for our purposes than Thayer, who goes really in depth, gives you some classical stuff that you're never going to use in the New Testament. But regardless, um, let's move back into what we've been starting with verbs. Uh, again, we're still in English review, and we're seeing some parallels in English grammar to what we're going to see in Greek grammar. Agreement, the subject and the verb are going to match in person and in number. That's why we sometimes change how the verb looks because we're agreeing with the subject of the verb, whether it's I, you, or he, she, or it. Uh, and just for a reminder, I'm sure we all know this, but when we talk about first, second, and third person, if it's first person singular, what is the pronoun we use? I. If it's second person singular, what is the pronoun we use? You. If it's third person singular, what is the pronouns we use? He, she, or it. And there we see that we have masculine, feminine, and neuter uh, in English. If you move into plural, a first person plural would be we. A second person plural would be you or y'all. Uh, in fact, the, the other grammar that I like um, by, um, oh, what were their names? Uh, anyways, beginning with New Testament Greek. Uh, whenever he's teaching through, he'll say, y'all is the best translation of that. And he's, he's a uh, seminarian, Baptist seminarian up in um, Louisville or Lexington, Kentucky. And so he uses y'all. Um, and then a third person plural in English would be a pronoun of they. Um, we are going to use those pronouns the, the way they are. They is not a, first per or a third person singular. We are never using it that way. Even though modern uh, are trying to move toward a they, first person, singular, um, we are going to use they as a third person plural. So we're going to see agreement. 
And that's going to come across when we get into Greek. Uh, tense. In English, tense is de describing the time of the action. And you can get into more detail. The simplest way of categorizing that is, if you're talking about time of action in English, it is past, present, or future. Past, present, or future. You can give a little ad additional details depending on how you frame the verb. Uh, you could have ongoing time in the past. You could have ongoing time in the present, on the future. Uh, simple time in the past, simple. And we'll look at each of those in a little bit when we get to Greek. Uh, voice, this describes the relationship of the subject to the action. So if it's an active voice, who is doing the action? Subject. Now, what is the relationship of the subject if it is passive voice? It's receiving the action. So I was hit by the ball. All right. Then we have mood, which is the relationship of the action to reality. We have concepts like you have the indicative, which is portraying reality of sorts. Uh, we are also we could also move out of the indicative into the subjunctive, where it's the possibility, the conditional, uh, and so on and so forth with the imperative, the infinitive, participles, those are usually described in this category of mood, though technically I don't think participles are a mood in and of themselves. And then that brings us to participles, which are ing words. Again, I bring this up in English review because it's going to be vital when we get to Greek uh, and how they function. In Greek uh, and in English, uh, I think they can f function as adverbs, adjectives, or nouns. Uh, and we'll see that same thing in Greek. So I gave an assignment, if you saw the email, of looking at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And I want us to just go quickly, line by line, and you tell me what is the English verb in the sentence, or in the phrase, if we break it down a little bit. So in the phrase, this is the message, what is the verb? Is. is. All right? We have heard from him. What would be the verb in that clause? Have heard. And announced to you. Announce, which is technically, and we have heard from him, and we announce, present tense, are announcing to you, that God is light, is, and in him there is no darkness at all, is, if we say that we have fellowship with him, all right, say, and then have fellowship, so you have the say verb, and then you have the content of that saying is, they are saying, we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, walk, we lie, lie, and do not practice the truth. Do practice. Now, this is a funny one in English. Technically, if you were probably in King James, it would practice not the truth, uh, something along those lines. Uh, we use a helping do if it, we negate it with not. So do practice uh, is literally just practice not or not practice. All right? Do, yeah. Yeah, if practice is in there, uh, do and practice are the same verb uh, in essence. Um, we Do is just kind of helping in, in modern English with the not. Um, but if we walk in the light, walk, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses, very good. So let me highlight all those. And so we notice here we have several verbs, if you will. What, and let's, let me bring up a, a uh, pointer. And I'm going to be under the verb that I want us to focus on here. What is the subject of is? This, very good. What is the subject of have heard? We. What is the subject of announce? We, very good. Uh, what is the subject of is? God. What is the subject of is here? Ah, <laughs> this is a fun one. It is. Darkness is the subject of is. We could, there is just a helping, uh, where literally this is, darkness is not in him at all. Darkness is not in him at all, but we normally kind of flesh that out. There is no darkness in him at all. all right? So darkness is the subject of this sentence. 
Greek makes that a little easier because it will give you that this is in the nominative case. Um, what is the subject of say? We. What is the subject of have? What is the subject of walk? We. What is the subject of lie? What is the subject of do practice? We. What is the subject of walk? What is the subject of is? He. Very good. Uh, what is the subject of have? We. And what is the subject of cleanses? Blood. Very good. Now, just a couple of uh, other notes that you can even see in the English text here. When we talk about tense, what is is? Past, present, or future? Present. What is have heard? And simplest terms here. <laughs> simplest terms. <laughs> it is a past form. It's giving us a form of the... Uh, uh, it's giving us a little of the nuance of the past, but it is, in essence, something that has happened and um, has, uh, it doesn't necessarily have remaining effects in, in, uh, in English, though that is what it is in the Greek. Um, announce, present, is, is, we'll say that, um, say, present. For which one? Yeah, that, that's interesting. We'll talk about that. Um, it's And that, that word is called aorist, um, the aorist tense, and it's in Greek. And that is, no, well, that, in, in Greek, it would probably be pronounced a little bit more like what you said it, but in English, we usually just say aorist. Um, but the... <laughs> yeah, well, that, that wouldn't be a tense you would teach in English necessarily. It's, but... The best we can do in Greek or in English is to usually do it in a past tense of sorts. But an aorist, this is an aorist subjunctive, and we'll talk about this more. But we probably wouldn't say if we should say. Um, it would probably the if is a condition, and so it's taking it out of the realm of rea reality. And so it's if we say, and it's just kind of looking at the say concept without necessarily looking at it in time. But in English. I think this is the best way to say it is if we say, just in a general sense, if someone were to say is kind of the idea. Um, and we'll get into that more in Greek, but I think it's okay to kind of look at it that way. Yes, and that's another. Uh, with cleanse? Oh, yes. Right. Uh, it's not, it wouldn't be the aorist, I don't think, that would be the mind tense. The that would be the subjunctive. subjunctive. Yeah, but let me look there in verse number seven. Um, I don't think cleanse would be in the subjunctive. I think that would actually be a present. Let me get there. Uh, yeah, present active, present active indicative. So that one's not a, that that one's not a subjunctive. Hmm. That's interesting. We'll we'll have to come back to that and see where, what interlinear brought that up. All right. So and so on and so forth. The the point I'm wanting to make is, sometimes what we don't think about, is. The, we, we don't slow down even in English and think about who is the subject. Is this past, present, or future? What, it, what implications might that have? For instance, this is the message. He's saying this is presently the message that we have heard. Then you have to think about who is the we. In context, he seems to be talking about the apostles, those eyewitnesses of Jesus. And when did they hear it? They heard it in the past. And once we get to Greek, we're going to find out, and that has lasting effects even into the present, and now we are announcing it. So you get this picture of, we heard it now, right now, we are announcing it. So you can even think about that from an English translation before even going into Greek. Uh, I do think about it in English. Mm -hmm. Good. When I'm reading the context, I, think, I might look at a long sentence and there'll be several phrases in there. Okay, what, who is doing this? And if when you're reading a sports article, the grammar is probably so, I was going to say, I'm not sure the guy who wrote the article thought that. 
phrase doesn't fit. So my point is that even in English, you, you need to know what um, is being said so you'll understand the import of the sentence. Right. That's not a problem in the Bible because you're not going to find you know, terribly worded sentences that uh, and, are not green enough. Sure, and what I might suggest is something we will, uh, just a little bit of pushback on that. What we will find is the more we learn about Greek, the more we find out that they didn't always use the best grammar. And it's usually kind of cleaned up a little bit in English translations for our readability. Um, for instance, John, John in the book of Revelation uses very strange grammar, probably purposefully, but it's very strange grammar for Greek. Whereas the book of Hebrews is the best grammar in the New Testament, and it harkens back to the classical era. So. And it's also hard if you read some of Paul's writings in the letters. Yeah. Because they'll say, Jesus Christ, who went to heaven and did this, where he was, and then another yes. phrase, and then another phrase, and another phrase. A long, long, long sentence. And to try to parse that sentence, yeah. try to drop, diagram that sentence. That's tough. Yeah, for thinking of Paul, Ephesians is probably the most notorious because in English it cleans it up a little bit, but uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, one sentence which a bunch, with a bunch of relative clauses just attached to it. Um, chapter 3, he starts out with prisoner of the Lord and so on and so forth. He says, uh, goes through and talks about the mystery, and then you have, in essence, well, you have that, I guess, before the mystery part, you have a dash. And he doesn't pick that part up again until you get to the prayer at the end of the chapter. And so it's interesting when you start thinking through that and why he might have done the things that he did. Um, but English translations, especially the more readable ones, like the, um, well, even the quote-unquote literal ones, but you know, especially the NIV, they'll just chop up Greek phrases all over the place, insert uh, subjects or um, assume subjects and things like that. Um, New American Standard does it too, ESV does it too, and it's just for English readability. And that's why I do think it is helpful to kind of be able to pick your way through an interlinear to kind of see how did the original author kind of work this together. Because sometimes it doesn't change anything doctrinally, but it is interesting to see how he framed his argument, what he was connecting that is sometimes lost in English translation. Um, continuing... Studier and teacher, I don't know if you call him a scholar, but um, that when, when asked the question, what does learning Greek teach you, or what insights do you have about the Bible that you don't get from the English language? The answer is not much. Yeah. Not really, and not much. So, in other words, we can, our English translations are reliable yeah. overall. I, I agree. I agree that you can, the, the way I like to describe it, I think I've I probably stole this from someone else, but is that it's like watch, when you read an English translation, it's like watching a show in black and white. And then whenever you can read it in the original, it's like adding color. And so it gives you a little bit of nuance here and there. Um, there are some things that I think modern translations kind of miss, um, especially if they have a, a kind of an agenda, uh, maybe a not, not that I think a lot of translations are just hitting on this. It's just so ingrained in them, the doctrinal error, that they are unwilling to move in literal directions sometimes. But um, this, this kind of a class will help you to be able to pick apart what your translation is saying and see, is it accurate here? What can I learn from this? Um, so we also have here, and we're not going to go through again. Let me just bring up the, um, the verbs here. If we say... Um, Again, that's probably a, uh, well, that's a subjunctive because it is conditional. It's if this might happen. It's not that it necessarily has happened, but if we were to say that we have no sin. Um, and notice here that you have some interesting parallels, changes. We have no sin. What tense is have? Present. But then you shift to another one in verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, now what tense are we? Yeah, we're, we're moving it to a past concept uh, in English. And so you see some little differences of he's saying, if we presently have no sin, and then if we say we have not sinned, um, you, you get some interesting little nuances there that are even in the English text. And he says, 
in essence, in the then clause, the protasis of the conditional, if we are deceiving ourselves and we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So what I would hope is that by learning a little bit of Greek, it'll at least slow you down to think about some of the tenses, the subjects, the, and the verbs themselves. Now I want to move into aspect. Um, and this is English review, but it's not as clear in English as it is in Greek. So I'm going to try to make as many parallels as I can in English so that Greek makes a little more sense, but just know there are some things that do not translate directly between the aspect of English verbs and the aspect of Greek verbs. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about aspect? We're talking about the kind of action, the type of action that is being described. For instance, is there a difference between me saying, I ran yesterday, and me saying, I was running yesterday? What tense are we, in essence? Past. We, we are looking at something that occurred in the past. But what's the difference between saying, I ran, and I was running? Yeah, that, that's usually what we're waiting for is, well, what happened while you're running? Sometimes, but in a general sense, we're also talking about, I ran. You're just thinking about the whole action. But when you say, I was running, you're starting to kind of picture the actual event. Um, and so you have the difference between something in progress, I was running in the past, versus something that happened, just the whole action in the past. And so even in English, we can describe past activity as either something that happened and just thinking about the verb, just thinking about the action itself, or we can think about the movement of the action, the, the, the progressive ongoing nature of the action. We can bring that into present. I run and I am running. We could even push it into the future um, to I will run and I will be running. And both of those kind of have the differences in past, present, and future of action as a whole versus ongoing picture of that idea. Um, I'll bring it up now. Oh, go ahead. In English, what we're going to find in Greek is that um, you have different tenses uh, for the past tense. Well, you have... No, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll bring it up here. In Greek... Your present tense has one form. It could be this, or it could be this, the point action, progressive action. In the past, in Greek, you could have point, or you could have ongoing, but this would be the aorist tense. This would be the imperfect tense. And we'll see some differences as we, we move through. But I'm just pointing out that in English, we do that. We have some helping words to kind of portray the differences they will sometimes use different tenses altogether to portray the type of action that is occurring, whether it's point action or progressive action. Point action or progressive action. Any additional thoughts on that question? We don't even think about it when we say it, but we do it. <laughs> and just kind of intuitively, we're thinking about the kind of action that we are describing. And just as in English, where we say, I was running yesterday, and then you're almost expecting and then a dog came out and bit me, uh, you're expecting the other part of the story that is usually the point action to follow. Greek will do that as well at times. It'll use the imperfect just to push the story along. So we'll see that as we move through. Um, so the first is undefined. The second is continuous. Now let me bring it up now because I think it is a helpful illustration. If we were to think about these kinds of actions, I like to think about a blimp and a parade. Now, if you are sitting up here in the blimp and you see the parade happening down here, you are seeing the big picture. You're seeing the whole parade. You're looking at the whole parade. If you're standing down here, you're seeing a segment. You're seeing it in progress as it's moving past you. So this would be the undefined. It's just, you see the whole parade. This is the progressive, ongoing. This is, you're seeing it happening right before you. In Greek, this is everything. 
they want they will either portray it as I just want you to think about the whole parade and I don't want you to think about anything else or I want you to think about it happening right before you and aspect is much more important than tense in Greek if we were to use those two descriptions they are more concerned about how you think about the action than when the action actually happens this is where it takes some time you just have to keep thinking through it because that doesn't exactly parallel English. We are more concerned about when than what. They are more concerned about what than when. Right. So let me bring some illustrations up here. So a present um, active verb, if it is continuous, we will say, I am eating. If it's undefined, we will say, I eat. So notice, still present tense, it's just portraying the type of action, either continuous or undefined. We don't necessarily have a perfective idea the way it will be in Greek uh, for the eating that has lasting effects type idea. Um, we have a present passive, uh, insert joke. Uh, <laughs> all right, present passive, I am being eaten. You're kind of picturing it is action on, in, in progress versus I am eaten. Uh, you're, you're kind of picturing it as this is the state almost that I am in, but you're seeing the whole action. I, I am eaten, or maybe I have been eaten, uh, and it has a present concept. Uh, past active, I was eating uh, for continuous. Undefined, I ate. And perfective, I have eaten is where the high, I have eaten is the idea of it's something that has happened this doesn't work very well for moving it into the same perfective idea of Greek that we'll learn next time, but just be aware uh, that you have those forms at least. And present passive, I was being eaten, I was eaten, I have been eaten, uh, would be kind of the perfective idea. And of course, you can go to Jennifer or Brad to kind of see where I mangled the English there, but I'm trying to push it forward to what we're gonna be studying in Greek. So, someone read for us 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8. The one who does, you know, this is, uh, you know, regular things. The one who does sin is not the devil because the devil sins from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. All right. We have two descriptions of sin. The, that one says the one who does sin. Um, some translations say the one, the one who sins, I think something along those lines. There's been great debate here between Calvinist and non-Calvinist. Is this saying in the context that you can never sin, that you just don't sin anymore? Um, or is this saying that you don't make an ongoing activity of sinning or the one who does keeps on sinning is kind of the idea. Does anyone have the ESV there? I think you don't have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure it says the one who makes a practice of sinning. To cut, it's showing this concept of continuous. It's kind of knocking out the ends of both ideas. It's just portraying the type of action. The one who sins, the one who keeps on sinning. Not just a one-time thing, but makes a habit of sinning. Now, let's look at, uh, and the same thing could be said of de the devil, that he is sinning from the beginning. He he's made it an ongoing activity. Yeah, right, and the, the, I was trying to avoid the, the negative there, but both would be that idea of continuous activity. The one who keeps on sinning versus the one who does not keep on sinning kind of idea. Um, what about Matthew 4.11? Someone read that for us. All right. Um, angels came and ministered. Um, I need to check something very quickly because I didn't bring it up on the screen. Verse 11. All right. They came. We are, this is 
looking at past action. We are not supposed to see the angels as presently coming down. This is just simple, undefined past action. They came. So you have this picture of they must have come from heaven, but you're not supposed to envision the whole process of them coming to heaven. You're just supposed to picture they're there. They came. Um, now, interestingly enough, ministered in Greek is the continuous action in the past. And so once they came, they kept on ministering to him. Uh, kind of an interesting idea there. But the undefined part is the they came. Don't picture the coming. Just picture the came is kind of the idea. All right. And then perfective, uh, Matthew 9.22. Who's going to read that for us? All right. My faith has made thee whole. Does anyone have anything other than made thee whole there? Made you well? Um, faith has saved you? Uh, so, made you well. Has, has saved you. This is perfective. Her faith, now, she is been made well. That happened here fairly shortly before. But the idea is, now you are well in the present. And so it's something that happened in the past and has ongoing relevance in the present. It has effect in the present. That's what's going to be in Greek. Perfective is not exactly the same in English, and we shouldn't try to bring that over into English. But that is why they translated, has saved you. It's not that it's saving you right now. It's not that it will save you. It's not just that it saved you but it saved you, and you are in a state of having been saved. We're going to look at this more in Greek, but it's kind of like saying, I have been baptized. What am I saying by that? I am in a state of being a baptized person because of that action that happened in the past. That's what Greek is going to kind of um, lay out for us. All right, any questions about the English review there? Anything not make sense? All right. I'm not sure if it's consistent where you're mentioning something, but you can look at something else. If you're setting up verses, it's just the meaning of what you're talking about here or in more detail. Yeah, con context is going to determine that, whether it's emphasis or not, whether it's just pushing the narrative along or whether it wants you to focus on the action. Um, we're going to ignore that pushing the narrative along idea for our purposes because that gets into more second, third year Greek stuff. For now, what we're going to do is try to memorize, like we did with nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative, apply an overarching idea for each of those. We're going to learn the terminology of Greek verbs to get a general sense of what it normally means uh, for each of those. But I did this lesson to kind of show you that we have some parallels in English that are going to help us as we translate the Greek um, and try to get a picture of the Greek view, the Greek language view of these things. Uh, let's go ahead and start on, we got five minutes, I think, unless that, that wasn't the second bell, was it? All right. Then let me uh, start on the next one here. We got five minutes to kind of maybe apply some of these principles from English. All right, why is that not showing? Hmm. I've lost my presenter view. That's what I wanted. All right, so going back one slide. So Greek verbs are going to be very similar. We're going to see that they inflect, they change form, just like some English verbs change form to agree with the subject. Uh, in English, this is weak, in, um, but you see the same thing in Spanish and Italian and French. Uh, you see it very much the same in Greek for those strong inflected languages. So what do we mean by inflection? 
Well, simply what I want you to get in mind when you hear the word inflection is changing form to match subject. Changing form to match subject. And also, we're going to see how that affects the tense, uh, the aspect of the verb. Um, so the stem of a Greek verb usually stays the same and carries the meaning. This happens in English as well. What is the stem of he learns? What is the part that stays the same across the board? Learn. The S tells you nothing about the meaning of the verb. Learn tells you everything about the meaning of the word. It's the same in Greek. We're going to have endings that are attached to tell you if it's first, second, third person, singular or plural. But this part that doesn't change is the part that carries the meaning of the word. And so we're going to look for that stem because it's going to help us to understand what is the meaning. Then we add on the personal endings, sometimes called the suffixes, what you add to the end of the word, kind of like a prefix is what you add to the beginning of a word. Suffix is what you add to the end of the word. Um, a Greek verb that is what changes to agree with the subject. So for instance, we have up here, um, agapisen, do you remember what that means? Love. So we have the agape part, the technically this egop, e is the stem of the word, and I'll show you how we would eventually get to that. But you have an ending that's added, n or sen, um, that agrees with the third person noun, the God. The God, and the idea is he, not I or you, but the God, he, God loved. God loved. And you know that your subject is this God because, one, this is in what case? Nominative. And also you get the added help that this is a third person singular ending. You don't have to know, memorize that yet or even ever memorize it. But it's these two agree. And it is the gop part, <laughs> the egop uh, part that has stayed the same and tells you this means love. And then... Because of the ending, it tells you that it is he loved. The noun tells you it's God love. And actually, the sin part tells you it's loved instead of loves or will love. And all that's going to be visible in your inner linear as we work our way through. Um, now, if you were to change the ending just a little bit to igapi san, you'd have to have a subject that's plural because this is a third person plural. So they loved. Who is the they? The gods loved the world. So you could have a change in ending, just as you did with nouns. You could have a change in ending on verbs to tell you that this is the subject. This is how you're going to translate this word. Now, next time, I'm going to throw this up just for visibility, and then we'll stop for today. We're going to see what the endings of the present active indicative verb are. And if, you, if we were doing this kind of all year, you would memorize O-E-C-E, omenere usi. Uh, you would just memorize those endings, get them in your head until you can't help but remember them. Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to use our little uh, parsing help from our interlinear. But I want to show how these things are going to start working together, see the inflection, see how they change, and then we'll start thinking about the grammar itself. Of what is the aspect of these tenses? What, what is being portrayed by these verbs? And uh, we'll have to think Greek instead of think English, but it will start to help us to see the parallels. Any final comments or questions? Appreciate everyone's participation.